Yeah, thank you very much. I think it's a very specific format that we've been given today, so we don't have a real moderator and we have to moderate ourselves and I thought I would be a little bit more moderator. And I would suggest that we divide this lecture in three parts. One part devoted a little bit looking backwards, one part devoted uh, to the present, and one part looking ahead. And starting with the backward looking part, I myself was always a supporter of the Euro. I even initiated a manifesto for the, for the Euro among German professors in 1997, which pleased Chancellor Kohl, so he called me because he was surprised that there were even economists who found it a good idea. But sometimes I have sleepless nights and ask myself, was it really a good thing with this Euro? And now, as, as it is approaching its 17th birthday, I would like to ask you this question. Was it really a good idea or was it flawed from the beginning, what some of the Anglo-Saxons say, they, they always told you it's, it's wrong. And so what is your view? Well, s since, uh, since the very beginning and since uh, before the beginning, uh, a bias, anti-Euro bias, uh, has existed uh, uh, very, very much, I have to say, also on the other side of the Atlantic, perhaps on the other side of the Channel from time to time, and uh, say elsewhere in the world. And uh, I was told myself, first, the euro is impossible. You, you will not make it. It's uh, not doable. I was told that uh, still in New York, eight months before the euro uh, started, uh, with a lot of people absolutely convinced that it was too bold to be true and too difficult to perform. Then when we had the euro, the idea was uh, it, it is a currency that will not be credible at all. Uh, it will collapse at a time very rapidly. It will not be trusted by investors and savers the world over. Then the uh, thesis was the euro area will evaporate, of course, if there are events that are very demanding and if there are shocks. Now, let's see what happened. First of all, the main reproach, the main criticism against the euro was not that it was about to be not credible, but that it was too credible. As you might remember, in my time, for instance, the euro was considered <coughs> too strong. And it was considered too strong until a recent period of time, say one year ago, one year and a half ago. Uh, it's very paradoxical for a currency which was supposed to evaporate, disappear, and uh, be a total failure. Very paradoxical. Uh, when we had the worst financial crisis ever since World War II, could have been the worst since World War I, in my own understanding, in 07-08, uh, the uh, Euro area members were 15. And most of the same persons, observers, that uh, you were mentioning, Professor Buffinger, uh, were saying, of course, it will explode. Now, at the moment I'm speaking, the 15 that were in the Euro area uh, in, uh, at the moment, the 15th of September 2008, namely, uh, the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers are still there, all of them, without exception. And uh, of course, we have the memory of what happened in Greece and why Greece stayed in the EU area with 69% of its own people asking the country to stay, when seen from uh, a long distance, the idea was, of course, they will call to quit because it's too hard to be in the EU area. It was exactly the contrary, by the way. But the 15 are 15, but four new countries decided to enter in the EU area since Lehman Brothers bankruptcy. Four new countries, the three Baltics and Slovakia. So we are 19 today. Don't consider that I'm complacent. I'm not complacent. I'm only mentioning the fact uh, to all of us, beware of the bias, beware of the anti-euro bias, beware of the anti-euro area bias. These are very, very bad advisors, if I may. And one can, make, can lose a lot of money in betting on the explosion of the concept. 
of this very bold concept that we are pursuing. Because one of the difficulties that the Europeans have is that it is so natural for them to go to this ever deeper union that they are forgetting that what they are doing is bold and even very bold. And so that it is demanding. But it is much more resilient than uh, external observers can trust. And I take it myself that what counts in the medium and long run is that we will demonstrate, demonstrate that growth and jobs are part or full part of the success of the euro area. As you know, the euro area has proof with uh, lack of governance, lack of proper governance, that it was stretched between very good signature and very bad signature, very good, be good behavior, obviously, uh, great success against unemployment on the one hand, and bad behavior and uh, very poor results in terms of jobs, uh, creation, and employment. So the characteristic of the euro area is that as an average, as a consolidated entity, it was more or less uh, at the level of the other advanced economy, or even better. Certainly better in the fiscal side of the coin. But, of course, uh, we had this stretching, which calls for uh, reinforcing formidably, in my opinion, governance uh, in the euro area. So, I, in my sleepless nights, I will remember what you say. So, it has been resilient and strong. And uh, the, the problem that there has been anti-European uh, tendencies now in, in several countries that unemployment is high and that people are really questioning this idea, but that's something one has to take serious now. Yes, you're absolutely right. But again, there also the anti-Euro, anti-European bias operates. When I look at the statistics of the survey of the Eurobarometer, there are, and I recommend you to look at it because it's done every six months. It's a very, very interesting uh, survey all over Europe, all countries. And what you will discover is very surprising. The European fellow citizens are not happy with their institution in general and their leaders in general. Not true necessarily uh, in this country, but I'm speaking of the European as a whole, the Euro area countries as a whole, Euro area country in particular, but not exclusively. And what you are discovering is that they have more confidence in the European Parliament than in their own domestic national parliament. Very paradoxical, because what you read is exactly the contrary. But when you look at the survey, there is a big difference in terms of confidence. Also, very surprising, even more surprising, more confidence in the Commission than in the national governments. Again, as I said, not necessarily the case in Germany, but for the <laughs> European as a whole. So, the idea that Europe is rejected and that this is the main message of our fellow citizen doesn't seem to me to be exactly true. Authorities are rejected, institutions are rejected, <coughs> leaders uh, in of all sensitivities and persuasions are, uh, uh, are not at the level of confidence they had before because the crisis has triggered that, not only in Europe also in the other advanced economy. The very same extremist, quote-unquote, that you have in Europe and in the Euro area or in the continent, you have also in the US, in the UK. And so we, we clearly have a problem which is, to me, generalized in the advanced economy. It's a real problem. We have to take it very, very seriously. We proved extremely clumsy, all of us, all advanced economy in the recent period, in the crisis, we proved uh, more than clumsy, we proved uh, culprits uh, in having this abominable crisis. And the people, uh, our fellow citizens, saw that. And uh, they are not happy at all with that. On top of that, of course, you have a lot of other reasons. The general, I would say, uh, change at the global level 
between the balance between advanced economy and emerging economies, uh, all these structural reforms that are uh, triggered by these uh, dramatic uh, changes of technology, science and technology, IT, uh, uh, again globalization. All this creates uh, for our fellow citizens in the advanced economy uh, a level of stress and uh, all institutions are uh, paying a price for this stress. I was only to, to show you that it is not localized in Europe. When you look at the confidence in the US Congress by the American citizens, you have a figure which is a one figure mark. So it's extremely poor, the confidence in this particular very, very important institution in the US democracy. Again, it captures this idea. We have a real, real problem with all our fellow citizens that we have to treat very, very seriously. But to take it that it is against Europe makes no sense. It's much more complex than that. And uh, in my own, I would say, uh, diagnosis, uh, Europe is a part of the solution for the European themselves. So if you talk to the average German these days about the ECB, you find a relatively negative attitude, and mainly because of the fact that Germans say the German saver is expropriated by the very low interest rates, zero interest rates, and then I always say look around in the global economy, this low or zero interest rates is nothing specific to the Eurozone, you have it in the United States, in the UK, in Japan. Um, so it's, it's a more global phenomenon. And of course this raises a question if we have this very uh, expansionary monetary policy since, since many years, and we have in addition also relatively lax fiscal policies also in, in many countries, in the US, in the UK, in Japan, they don't have the balanced budget, the black zero that we appreciate so much in Germany. So you have expansionary fiscal policies, expansionary monetary policies, but you don't see inflation. Rather, it's the opposite. There are deflationary tendencies. And so the question is, what is wrong with the global economy? There are people like uh, Larry Summers who talk about this uh, secular stagnation. And so I would like to hear your views. Is there something fundamentally wrong or fundamentally different in the global economy in the last few years compared to periods before that, that we don't see the inflation that our standard textbook uh, would would forecast. So, is there something which which is different? Yeah, I, I think it's a very very important uh, question. Of course, first of all, first remark: we are probably underassessing the gravity of the crisis we had to cope with in 07 08. Uh, in 07, 9th of August 07. I wake up, I was uh, in my dear uh, French Brittany, and we had no money market functioning the 9th of August 2007. So we were losing total control of our market. It was the subprime, and the subprime was expanding its uh, drama all over the world, and particularly at that very moment in our own market. And we decided in a very short span of time, it was two hours and a half span of time, we decided to give all liquidity that all commercial banks in the EU area would call for. And a number of financiers and bankers are in this room, they might remember that. We were asked to deliver, to supply 95 billion euros. And it was a, a dramatic shock the world over because it represented more than uh, 100 billion dollars in one shot and uh, of course we delivered it was for one day for liquidity for one day at the level of uh, interest rates which uh, was uh, the level decided by the ECB at the time and uh, we, uh, we we could you know be uh, re take control of our market. But it was totally dramatic. Never happened since World War II. We, we were in a totally dramatic area. And when we had, in the 15th of September 2008, the collapse of Lehman Brothers, uh, all the house of cards of global finance in the advanced economy was falling down. 
under our eyes. It was totally dramatic. Had we not reacted swiftly and boldly, in my opinion, we would have had something worse than 29 uh, of the previous century, 2930s, because you know the contagion was immediate. It was a real-time contagion. Uh, when uh, in uh, 2930, it was, you know, a quarter <coughs> contagion. You, you had uh, drama here, and then uh, it took a lot of time to be communicated to the rest of the world. So we, we were very close to an absolute drama, of course created by loose policies before, by piling up of debt, public and private before, and uh, if we avoided the drama, we nevertheless had a very large, a very deep and terrible recession, but we had not the great depression that was at stake uh, had we not reacted very boldly. So it's not, in my opinion, too surprising that uh, we are still under the shadow of something which was much grave, much graver, if I may, than what we think because, again, thanks to central banks and thanks to government, we avoided the absolute drama. So that's the first remark. Let's continue to understand that we are still in the shadow of an absolute drama that we succeeded to avoid, but was virtually there, and still is in uh, some respect there. We are still working to correct the misfunctioning, uh, the disruption of uh, the market that we had at the time. So th that's a first remark. A second remark, uh, of course, is that uh, the central banks have decided to do all what they could uh, to get back to what they consider, rightly so, in my opinion, uh, the appropriate uh, price stability definition. And let me uh, tell you, Professor, that uh, I consider that there is something extremely important which happened in the crisis as a consequence of the crisis. All central banks of the advanced economies consider now that the right definition of price stability is 2% or less than 2, but very close to 2, as is the case in uh, Europe. But before the crisis was not the case. The US had no definition, no precise definition of price stability. Japan had no precise definition of price stability. Uh, the US decided to have a precise definition in 2012 and uh, the Japanese in 2013. Now the four central banks that are issuing the four currencies that are in the basket of the SDR have the same definition of price stability. I call that conceptual convergence. It's one of the dimensions of the convergence between central banks, which uh, is certainly very, very important. Now, you have other explanations for uh, the situation in which we are. Mediocre growth in the advanced economy, very low inflation, very low interest rates, and uh, as you said, Larry Summers uh, and others have their own explanation of uh, that, uh, that situation, which uh, in, uh, for, for some of them is calling permanently for extremely loose monetary policy that are themselves nourishing, nurturing uh, new bubbles, and that uh, makes us, uh, you know, going from bubble to bubble uh, because of this uh, defect of the uh, advanced economy. I must confess myself, I don't trust that we are, which is one of the theses behind the secular stagnation, that we are in a period which is dramatically lacking uh, science and technology uh, impulses. Uh, it seems to me, on the contrary, that uh, IT, uh, not only IT, but science and technology is uh, uh, progressing, proceeding on a very large front, and uh, I uh, would be extremely surprised myself that we could really uh, trust that uh, productivity progress at a time where the, the IT is uh, disseminated uh, and disseminating 
in all uh, part of the production process of uh, goods and services, I would be extremely surprised that we would have in the long run a dramatic uh, weakness of the uh, productivity. I, on the contrary, I have a tendency personally to be much more optimistic, to consider that uh, uh, the, the, the famous solo paradox appeared not to be a paradox uh, in the 90s uh, when we could see some surge of productivity progress uh, in, the, in the US in particular. And I think that we will have probably the same surprise. One element I would draw your attention to, and if, as a professor, you have uh, identified good uh, academic research on that, I'm very impressed by the fact that in some sectors, digitalization uh, is uh, in eliminating atoms uh, and replacing the atoms by bits. Take music, for instance, uh, are, uh, uh, I would say, paradoxically, when you have uh, obvious increase of the volume of music which is uh, uh, consumed by, by the uh, consumers, uh, you see a decrease of the contribution to the GDP because you have no more records. Yeah. And uh, so there is a paradox there, perhaps linked to the fact that the consumer surplus becomes gigantic and does not impact at all the uh, GDP. So perhaps we are underestimating, to be clear, and called to underestimate growth and therefore productivity because of the very uh, process of uh, IT and of g digitalization. I must confess, I'm convinced that there is something there. I still uh, didn't see convincing academic research, but uh, it seems to me that it is one of the areas where we should re reflect more and, and work more. Maybe you allow just one question going back to the past. You said this financial crisis was so huge. And there's a famous question by the Queen who asked when she, when she visited the London School of Economics when it was so huge, how come nobody could see it in advance? So at the ECB, did you see some warning signs in, in, so in summer or spring 2007 or did it really come as a total surprise? No, it didn't come as a total surprise. Otherwise, we could not have decided to give 95 billion euros to our commercial banks in two hours and a half of meditation. So no, uh, we, I remember myself uh, being uh, uh, the chair of the global economy meeting in Basel where, where we have the gathering of uh, central banks uh, t telling at the end of 06, beginning of 07 that there were, there were a general under assessment of the financial risks, of the volume of risk and of the price of risk in the global, uh, in global finance. Because it, it was not my own idea, it was the idea of the central banks when they were gathering uh, in Basel. And I was happy in retrospect to have been in first page of the Financial Times with a warning in January 2007. So, say seven months, eight months, before the real explosion of the uh, uh, subprime crisis. So uh, the fact that there were a general underassessment of risk was uh, perceived as one of the dimension of the uh, difficulty. What, is, what remains absolutely clear is that after the explosion of the uh, crisis of the subprime, uh, during uh, the year in between uh, this uh, you know, very moment where major money markets in the advanced economy were disrupted and uh, the moment of the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, one of the dominant theses was previously we were underestimating the price of risk and the volume of risk, now there is a general reassessment, it's good, it goes in the right direction. Risks are reassessed in all uh, segments of markets, in all asset classes, and it goes in the right direction. Uh, which might explain why, the, uh, wh when uh, it was decided that there was no solution for Lehman Brothers, uh, the first rhetoric of the uh, uh, executive branch 
in the United States was to say, well, we are in a market economy. In a market economy, it's absolutely normal that uh, you have bankruptcy. Or in Soviet Union, you had no bankruptcy. So bankruptcy is the normal consequence of uh, mismanagement. And this rhetoric lasted two days and a half because, as I said already, the house of cards was collapsing. And the bankers and the central bankers were reflecting themselves how to cope with that and one of the uh, points I would like to make is that when I was mentioning the bold and swift response of the central banks, you have to have in mind that during the Monday afternoon, the Monday morning, the bankruptcy is announced. Monday afternoon, Tuesday and Wednesday, all major central banks of the world were reflecting on which measures to announce simultaneously, all together, with the same wording, same publication, at the very same moment, after having decided that in the Open Market Committee meeting, in the Governing Council here, in the various Monetary Policy Council, in all advanced economy, and the Thursday, following the, month, the announcement on the Monday, we were able to say, uh, there, are, uh, there is a crew in the uh, cabin uh, of, the, of the plane, and this is the decision we are taking. It was, you know, these coordinated swaps between the, the major central banks, and uh, we will deliver, we will supply liquidity uh, as, uh, you know, necessarily as, uh, as is required. And, uh, and we had exactly the same wording simultaneously in New York, in Frankfurt, in uh, Tokyo, in London, uh, in Zurich, and, and so forth. So, uh, the fact is that we discovered in real time that we were in a world where the piling up of, uh, of debt on the one hand and the uh, emergence of new property of global finance and of the global economy due to the, interconnect, the generalized interconnection of all markets, all asset classes, all countries, uh, uh, at least uh, in the advanced economy, was conducting to some kind of immediate generalized contagion if we had a very, very dramatic event. I trust that we are still in that world. And it, of course, it's a dangerous world, much more dangerous than that we had known in the past. The good news in this very bad news that uh, I mentioned is that we had the capacity ourselves to react with extraordinary rapidity. And uh, so it is this extraordinary rapidity which would have been tot totally unthinkable uh, before that permitted us to remain more or less more or less the master of this uh, situation. So let me jump to the present situation. One week ago our council has presented its annual report uh, to the Chancellor and uh, the majority of this council has made the recommendation concerning monetary policy to say it would be better to decelerate or even to stop uh, the quantitative easing of the ECB and they say this is mainly due to the growing risks of this very low interest rate environment uh, to the financial system. So, how do, we, do you see the situation uh, of, the, of the financial markets or the financial system? Are we already in a situation that is similar to the situation, let's say, in 2006 or 2007, where there are risks building up um, that could lead to a new financial crisis? And could this be an argument to say, okay, it's enough with this quantitative easing. It, we have to reduce it or even stop it. At least we should not, we should not increase it as, as it is discussed right now. The counterfactual is always very, very difficult. I told you that we were in a situation and still are in many respects in the advanced economy which is extraordinarily demanding. And in my own understanding, the central banks, and I'm addressing the decisions of all central banks of the advanced economy, because they, they have taken with different form, different tools, 
uh, more or less the same, very same attitude, uh, which was extremely accommodating, obviously, and uh, I trust that it was appropriate. In my time, you might remember that uh, uh, we gave liquidity on a, an unlimited basis to all our banks. We started that in, uh, as I say, in August 2007. We generalized that after the Lehman Brothers collapse, and uh, it is still one of the characteristics of the ECB that uh, there is a promise to supply liquidity on an unlimited basis at fixed rate uh, until a certain date, as you, as, you, as you know. We also decided to purchase treasuries, and uh, I remember it was a very, very dramatic time. Uh, in 10, when we purchased uh, Irish treasuries, uh, Greek treasuries, and uh, Portuguese treasuries. In my time, we decided also to purchase dramatically, in August 2011, treasuries of uh, Italy and Spain, at a moment where uh, 14, almost 40% of the GDP of the euro area was threatened by sudden stop as a consequence of the global financial crisis and of the sovereign risk crisis, which was hitting particularly the European area. So we, uh, we have taken very, very uh, bold decision. Uh, in the case of uh, the uh, ECB, which, uh, by the way, if you look at the balance sheet of the ECB on a pure quantitative basis, you will see that uh, uh, quantitative easing was much more modest in the ECB than, uh, than in the US, uh, in Japan, or in the UK. M much more than in Japan, where it is absolutely gigantic. Still, I draw your attention to the fact that before embarking on what uh, we call quantitative easing, we had the off-balance sheet commitment. I mentioned myself the off-balance sheet commitment of the illimited supply of liquidity at fixed rate, which is a very big off-balance sheet commitment. And I would mention also the OMT, which is an off-balance sheet commitment, which didn't function but exists and still exists and is uh, probably still important in the circumstances. First remark. Second remark, I would <laughs> suggest institutions, including the most noble institution in, in which you participate actively, not to embark too much on uh, criticism or advice to central banks. Uh, <laughs> 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 I can tell my colleagues. It's not only uh, in that case. I mean, I don't like too much the IMF embarking on dictating what the uh, you know, Open Market Committee should do exactly at this very moment. A, a general remark. But, but you know, guiding the the hand of the, of the central banks uh, too much uh, doesn't fit, in my opinion, with the independence of the central bank. And I'm very, very attached to the independence of the central bank. Again, it's a, it's a remark, uh, a general remark, uh, not a particular remark, uh, neither on your institution nor on uh, on the on the IMF. Uh, my understanding, if I want to sum it up is that these central banks are doing independently of, uh, you know, fully independently, very bold things because they have a duty which in all advanced economy now uh, is to get back to price stability as has been affirmed uh, before the crisis, in our case, and in the crisis, for the four central banks I have mentioned, uh, as uh, the appropriate level of medium long term price stability. It's very important uh, to facilitate, uh, I would say, relative price changes. It's very important when you have this piling up of the previous piling up of debt, and that you, you have to try to help the deleveraging, uh, the reduction of the level of debt. And of course, uh, you know, it doesn't help if you have uh, zero uh, infl 
inflation in the medium and long run, or even negative inflation in the medium and long run. So, so there, there is uh, some kind of obligation for the central banks to do things that are, uh, you know, in, in their mandate. That being said, of course, there are unintended consequences. They are fully aware of these unintended consequences, and uh, you mentioned these un unintended consequences, rightly so. Uh, but but uh, it is up, in my opinion, to the other partners, namely the executive branches, the parliaments, the, I would say, uh, economic agents uh, in general, even the social partners, to help in the circumstances and to take themselves the attitude, the behavior, the courageous decisions, the structural courageous decisions, the fiscal courageous decision, uh, the appropriate action to permit the situation to normalize. Because if what the central banks are doing rightly is utilized by the other partners to do nothing, then we are in the worst of the world possible. Completely agree. Um, but so even in the United States, you would not see the time now for raising interest rates. Isn't there a risk if you wait too long um, that you really make uh, increases of interest rates a taboo? That once you increase interest rate, let's say by 25 percentage points, then it will lead to a disaster. So that if you delay for too long, then it also can 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 be a problem for, for financial stability. No, I, I have full confidence in the Open Market Committee to take the right decision. Uh, I don't want to substitute myself neither to the Open Market Committee <laughs> nor to the Governing Council of the ECB. Uh, my colleagues uh, on both sides of the Atlantic have their responsibility. It's a very, very heavy responsibility. It's heavier than it should be, in my opinion, because of the other partners I mentioned. But it is a very heavy responsibility, I have full confidence. I have to say that seen from outside, the uh, preparation of the market participants, uh, the investors and savers in the US and abroad for a possible decision has been done very, very well, if I may. And uh, we will see what happens. Uh, there is an argument, I, again, I don't want to, uh, myself, to give any advice. But uh, I would only say that this argument that it is very grave that you could have divergences on both sides of the Atlantic between the monetary policy seems to me uh, strange. Because as I said, uh, the definition of price stability now uh, is the same on the two sides of the Atlantic. But the cycle is not the same. The situation is not the same. The US had a different cycle on the one hand. The US had no dramatic sovereign risk crisis when we had. So we are in different situation. It's absolutely normal that the monetary policy decisions are not the same. And even it would not be very good, in my opinion, at a global level, if all advanced economy would have exactly the same monetary policy decision, exactly at the same moment. It would be uh, amplifying ups and downs all over the world. So I am more satisfied with some kind of offsetting in the various situations, which again, are not artificial offsetting, but are linked to the uh, cycles that are different, the situations that are different. And uh, again, we will see what is being done. I have no advice, but I'm sure that they will take the right decision. Okay. So we are almost at the end of our time, but if you allow, I will just ask you uh, to the um, final part uh, that, that I had in mind, and that's the future of the euro. And I think there are different uh, designs for the future of the euro. I think one design is a more intergovernmental design which my colleagues in the council call Maastricht 2.0 and that is a design where we have a very strict <coughs> bailout clause, we don't have debt mutualization and our council, not me but the other four, uh, have made <laughs> the proposal for, I have to differentiate, have, have made now the proposal for an insolvency regime for sovereigns uh, so that, that it's easier uh, for governments to go bankrupt in order to make 
the bailout clause more strict and, and, and to, to enforce market discipline. I think that's one direction to go. Um, it's a direction for which you don't need further political integration. I think the other way is something one could call Euro 2.0, which means more integration, which means transferring fiscal policy responsibilities to the European level yourself. Yourself have made the proposal of a European finance minister, and in my view, if you go this way, you should also think of debt mutualization in some form for old debt or for new debt. So there are two completely different ways to go, and I would be interested to hear your views on which of the two paths you think is more promising. Uh, maybe, maybe uh, I would like to add. There's a third way which I think is the most dangerous, it's a kind of muddling through. That politicians uh, are not willing to discuss European integration and they say, well, we have Mario Draghi, who, whenever the situation becomes critical, then Mario Draghi comes in and saves the thing and so we don't have to do anything. So that's the third way, so to say, the muddling through way, which I fear is probably the most realistic. Well, again, I think that this dilemma uh, with different form is more or less the dilemma in all advanced economies. So again, let's not concentrate exclusively on our problem in Europe. Uh, we have all the problems of uh, the US, Japan, the UK compounded, plus, of course, our own historical endeavor. We want an ever deeper union, which is, by the way, called by the circumstances and by uh, the, the Euro uh, area uh, interlinkages. Uh, so uh, I think that this idea that the other partners could rely on the central banks to do the job and they would do nothing is absolutely true in all our uh, constituencies, if I may. And in Europe, particularly true because, again, we are, it's history in the making in Europe. We, we have to. Uh, draw all the consequences of our own observations, experience, and uh, uh, optimize. We optimized, in my opinion, much more than what has been perceived in the crisis, in reinforcing the stability and growth pact, which I still consider as absolutely essential in a single currency area. I don't know whether you would call that 2.0 to 3.0, 4.0, but it, it is there and it is important. Uh, we have created from scratch the MIP, the Macroeconomic Imbalance Procedure, which I trust is a second pillar for governance, which is extremely important. You know that since 2005, in the name of the ECB, I circulated all the evolution of the unit labor cost in the uh, euro area and what was uh, very visible very clearly is that we had persistent divergences of competitiveness inside the euro area which were not corrected it started in five five six seven eight nine and as you know it's end of nine that we had the start of the sovereign risk crisis in europe so uh, we 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 could see that something was happening which was very dangerous and there was no uh, uh, correction. Uh, so now we have the MIP. The MIP is, in my opinion, as important as the SGP. You know, to be able to correct imbalances, national imbalances within the euro area and, in particular, uh, cost competitiveness uh, uh, divergences that could be devastating. So this exists now, it, it didn't exist before the crisis. Now we have banking union, which is of course one of the major decisions which was taken in the crisis and goes quite far. So what else? That's your question. I would at this stage call first for a minister of finance of the euro area and a ministry of finance of the euro area. I uh, call that in my uh, Aachen speech uh, in 2011. And uh, of course, this entity would have, uh, would have to run the governance, the fiscal, economic, and financial governance of the Eurea to the extent that there are uh, you know, uh, 
element that are in the, the executive branch uh, uh, responsibility. That minister would be uh, vice president of the commission, in my uh, understanding, in order not to create uh, a lot of new institutions. But uh, it would be very, very, very important. But Already but with what we have, he would have a higher level of responsibility. But would the French government accept uh, the advice or the orders of a European finance minister? All governments have to accept the governance of uh, the economic, uh, fiscal and financial governance of the euro area because, again, uh, it goes uh, without saying that you have, if you have the single currency, you have to live with that governance. We take such a high price for not respecting the previous governance and for having a previous governance which was uh, insufficient, obviously, uh, that it seems to me that the experience is there and calls for, uh, for reinforcing the governance. I want to ask that. I'm asking you this because in Germany the general argument is if we, have, <coughs> we could have such a European finance minister, but the French government or French politicians would never accept it. So no, you are not so skeptical. But about be it. before the single currency, you could say the uh, country X or country Y, I don't mention any particular country, will never accept to have a central bank which would be fully independent and take its decision in full independence. So, I mean, at a certain moment, you take a decision, and that decision, uh, if it is a right one, of course, uh, <laughs> imposes itself. So, but but my, my intimate conviction is that if we want to draw all the consequences and the lessons from what we have experienced, in particular in this uh, abominable crisis, and again, it's a global crisis, it's not only a European specific crisis, the global crisis, we have to, to, to go in that direction. I would say reinforce the executive branch of the EU area, reinforce the legislative branch too. I think that, for instance, if there is precisely a disagreement, or more than that, between a particular country and the institution of the governance of the EU area, whether it is economic or, fi or fiscal governance, uh, as was the case, for instance, the very peculiar case of, uh, of uh, Greece, on its uh, you know, adjustment program. I trust really that the, the last word should be given to the representative of the people so that we would have a decision-making process that would be unchallengeable in terms of democratic legitimacy. And uh, only the European Parliament in the format where you have the MPs of the Euro area could, in my opinion, satisfy. Of course, you could organize very close relationship between national parliaments and the European Parliament. But if we want to avoid a succession of dramatic happenings, as we have observed in the past, at the level of heads, we should have a clear-cut system, a decision-making system, where every institution takes its part. And again, if one country challenges what is the intention or recommendation uh, of uh, the Commission and the Council, then we should uh, have the final word, the final say, uh, in a democracy by the representative of the people. So, again, as you see, reinforce the uh, executive branch, reinforce the legislative <coughs> branch. For the rest, I think that it would be opportune to have, indeed, the start of a budget of the euro area, but I think we should not dream of a very large budget. Uh, we, we clearly have uh, uh, countries that are not the equivalent of states in the US. Uh, Germany is not uh, Texas. Uh, France <laughs> is not uh, Florida. We, we are in a, in a different uh, uh, setting. And uh, we have to understand that what we will do will be very different, in my opinion, from any kind of model or whole model you could imagine. And uh, it is precisely what we are doing. It's history in the making in Europe. There is no blueprint. We, we have to reflect. We have to, to, to take account of the maturing of uh, our own people in the circumstances, which again are less anti-European than is suggested 
including in this country. Uh, it's very heartening to see the results of the poll, the survey. I was mentioning the Eurobarometer. When you look at what is the sentiment of the German fellow citizens uh, uh, and of the others, uh, <laughs> I mentioned also the Greek. So it is on this note of, uh, I would say, seriousness, no complacency, but confidence that uh, I would like to terminate. I think uh, with this very optimistic outlook, let's let's finish this talk. I could continue uh, talking with you for, for the next hour or so, but I think that's not what, what is scheduled. So thank you very much. I think it was very, very uh, stimulating uh, to have this, uh, this talk. And yeah, thank you.